Hey Greeley, hey everybody. Hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Wooten and I'm here on this live segment of Greeley Live bringing you information and um, just stuff that we want to talk about so that we all feel more connected. We all have uh, something else that we can think about other than what's going on out in the world. And uh, hopefully I can give you guys a couple of good tips. Today I'm going to be sharing some facts on COVID-19 and pets. We're only going to do that for a couple minutes because there's not much out there. Uh, and, and then we're going to be talking about some different ways to manage challenging, triggering situations. Right now, we are all together. All of us are together in a triggering situation. This provokes a lot of anxiety and fear and a lot of different emotions are coming and they're spilling out when we get poked. So we're going to talk about five ways that you could choose to respond to challenging situations. Okay, so before we get into that, I just want to give you guys the latest from the American Veterinary Medical Association. So I am a veterinarian. I graduated from UC Davis in 2002, practiced for 16 years, practiced here in Greeley at Banfield and Sheep Draw and Westridge, love all those um, hospitals. Um, but I'm also a member of the American Veterinary Medical Association, which is actively working on making sure that people and their pets stay safe and that our food supplies stay safe and all of that stuff's going on behind the scenes. And so here's what they know so far. There is no transmission of COVID-19 from pets to people. So your pets are not a source of infection of COVID-19 as of filming right now, okay? So you may have looked in the news and seen that there was two dogs in Hong Kong. Okay, two, two dogs. How many dogs are on this planet? There's billions of dogs on this planet, right? So um, there was two that tested a week positive in Hong Kong. And those dogs were not sick. Um, there was no symptoms. They've been following them. They've been testing them. And what they're finding is that our pets are not at risk for COVID-19 and they are not a source of infection for humans, vice versa. Pets to people, people to pets, okay? So if you're looking at your pet right now, your pet is not a source of infection for you. COVID-19 really likes hard, non-porous um, surfaces, so counters and doorknobs and things like that. It does not like animal fur. It gets all trapped up in there. So um, you're much more at risk from a doorknob than you are from a dog. There's also some reports coming out of people abandoning their animals out of fear uh, of this entire virus. And the thing is, is right now, um, your pets need you more than ever and you need your pets, okay? So, um, the thing is, is if you are following all of this news, the best thing to do is socially distance from anybody who um, you don't know their history and to wash your hands, wash your hands like 20 seconds, sing the alphabet twice, right? Um, if you are sick, uh, don't cuddle or kiss your pets. Try and get somebody else to care for your pets if you're feeling ill, you would do that anyways. And if you don't have that option, then just wash your hands before and after handling their food and use basic hygiene, okay? That's, that's all we really need to talk about. Our pets need us. They need us to continue to care for them. And we need our pets. So uh, one of the things right now is that stress, chronic stress can actually lower your immunity. And we all know that pets are a source of great stress relief. So there, now is a, there's no time that's better than now to go out and walk your dog. The, the weather right now is beautiful. So go take your dog for 30 minutes, walk twice a day. All right, stay your six feet away from other people, right? If you're sick, don't go out, but otherwise get outside, get some of that stress off of you and walk your dog um, and know that that's going to be good for you and that's gonna be good for your pet, okay? So that's about all I have on that, right? We don't wanna talk about the virus anymore. I wanna talk about the one of the most important things that we could be managing right now, um, which is our own mental state and our own emotional state. A lot of fear is going around and fear actually negatively impacts your immune system. It causes your adrenal glands to squeeze and you dump all the stress hormones into your body. Um, it can cause stress pooping. Anybody know about stress pooping? Okay, we don't want to make the toilet paper shortage worse. So you want to be able to mindfully manage your response. You're going to continue to get all these stimulus that come in, either from your friends or your family or social media or the news, and expect that you're going to hear more stuff that is going to, it's going to be triggering. It's going to be challenging. So you can't control any of that. None, none of it. 
But the one thing you can control in any challenge situation is how you choose to respond. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about five ways to respond to challenging situations. And I always love bringing in pets as good examples of how we should be or how we could be. And of course, I'm a veterinarian, right? So, and I love, love, love dogs. Love dogs. I have a dog myself. Her name is Alma. She's a, a golden doodle, light of my life, right? And she shows me how I can respond to challenging situations. So let's talk about five different ways and I'm gonna use five different dogs to illustrate the different choices that you could make the next time you run into something that's triggering, whether it is a scary news title or it's your child driving you crazy because you guys have been socially isolated for several days, okay? We're gonna talk about some different ways that you can choose to respond, all right? So here is the first choice. This is the attack dog. The attack dog, unfortunately, uh, I, I picked the Chihuahua because I don't know if you know, but oftentimes when the Chihuahuas will come into the vet hospital, they're like, nah, 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 right? And they just do it automatically. You look them wrong and they go, nah, 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 nah. well, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of people behaving like that right now too. It's a automatic stimulus response conscious cho uh, choice that we can make in a challenging situation. And the most primitive part of our brain it reaches for it automatically in situations where we feel threatened, right? Who is not feeling threatened right now, right? We all are. It's a survival mode reaction, and the part of the brain that runs this reaction doesn't know the difference between an actual physical attack, like, oh my gosh, I'm being mugged, or a scary news, line, news headline. It doesn't know the difference at all, okay? It doesn't know the difference between an emotional attack, a mental attack, or physical attack. So this uh, response can look something like this. Um, get off my back. I'm really, really stressed. Oh my God. I am so angry that that person took all that toilet paper. I am going to go and vent to my friend because I'm just really frustrated. Can you believe the nerve of that person? Ch like that, that person over there? Oh my gosh. I'm so stressed. How am I going to pay for my bills? I'm really, really angry about this whole thing that's going on. So... Any of the times where you are attacking something outside of yourself, that's when you are in the attack dog response. It can also look something like this, right? I love using pictures, uh, and this is a great little cartoon, but uh, you know we can automatically get thrown into this reaction even before we know what's going on. And when you're an attack dog, whatever's happening is definitely somebody else's fault. It's not your fault, right? Your mind is telling you that that other person or this situation or something outside of you is the problem. And it can sound something like this. It's because my kids are, or let's, it's how about this? It's because uh, I am out of work right now. I'm really, I feel really, really angry, right? It's normal. This is a normal response. This is a normal human response. Um, but the thing is, is you have other choices that you can make, right? So you could be asking yourself right now, in what situations right now do I act like the attack dog around my family or when I'm watching something or when I'm responding to a Facebook comment or something? So try and remember the last time that maybe your attack dog came out. Mine came out this morning already. I drove down the hill with my kids and it was stressful. And I was like, can you just be quiet, right? Attack dog. Um, how often is your response the attack dog? How does the attack dog response influence your life or your relationships, right? And if the attack dog is out, which I'm sure it's probably going to come out for you today or tomorrow or maybe in the next hour unless you're a levitating Zen Buddhist, right? It's a good time to ask yourself something. You're like, oh my God, my attack dog is out. Is my ego in check? Is this how I want to behave? Is this how I want to show up? Is this really the way I want to be? So that is the first response that you could choose uh, in any challenging situation. It's the most common, okay? The attack dog. All right, so the second response that you could choose in a challenging situation is this guy. The self-doubt or the fearful dog. I don't know about you, but I've never met an um, Italian miniature greyhound that believes in himself. So that's why I chose the miniature greyhound for this. So this dog is very, this, this choice that you have is very scared, right? This is a very scared little dog. 
Um, this dog is doubting everything about himself and everything around him, okay? It's very similar to the attack dog response, but if you're choosing this, you're turning that attack on yourself, right? So in challenging situations, instead of attacking others, we, uh, we judge ourselves and we criticize ourselves and we dwell on our other unworthiness and we make ourselves feel really scared. And this, friends, amounts to being violent towards yourself. Okay? Here we tend to be very, very vulnerable. It's where we protect ourselves from what we think is this evil, scary world. Uh, and we don't believe in ourselves when we're choosing this, this response. And the internal dialogue, if you're choosing something like this, is like, sounds like this. I'm not smart enough. I can't do this. I'm not capable. I'm not worthy. You have fears of everything. Fears of being rejected. Fears of, you know not having enough to eat, fears of disappointing others, fears of your children, fears of failing, fears of failing. So this type of negative, fearful self-talk, it seriously attacks our self-worth, right? And it limits our potential contribution to work and life, especially in a challenging time like this. This is you tripping yourself up. So if you think about challenging situations that you're having, you need to ask yourself, how often do I show up as the fearful or self-doubt dog, right? What are my fears in this scenario? Are they actually happening right now, right? Because right now, as you're watching this, you are probably safe, okay? And all of your fears are in the future, okay? What happens around me when I start acting like the fearful dog? And how would these situations be different if I chose a different response, right? So here's those first two choices of how you can behave in challenging situations. You have the attack dog or you have the fearful dog, right? And these are unfortunately the most common automatic re responses that Homo sapiens sapiens, our species, right? Unless there's a Homo erectus watching this. Any Neanderthals out there? Any? No? Okay. So the attack dog and the fearful dog are the most common uh, responses that you're going to reach for in challenging situations today and the days to come. And in order to get out of these responses and choose something different it requires interrupting these reactive neural pathways that you've built in your brain, right? So that interruption, if you don't want to be the attack dog or the self-doubt dog, looks something like this. It looks like hitting the pause button, right? It looks like, ooh, I really want to be triggered, but... I'm going to take a deep breath and count to 10. One, two, three, right? So in the heat of the moment, when you are hearing words or reading news lines or seeing things that are pressing your buttons and stirring up all your old stories that you have, it is very, very, very hard to hit this pause button. Pausing is something that you have to consciously practice over time. You, may, you might not get it the first time. You might not get it the 10th time. You might not get it the 20th time, but if you set your intention to actually choose this, your brain will get it over, over time. It may be after you've had the attack dog or the fearful dog response and you go, oh, what the heck was I doing? I want to hit the pause button, right? And even that awareness is going to build something different in your brain, okay? You may be in the middle of a reaction, right? I was yelling at my kids the other day and I was like, oh my God, no one's picking up their towels. And then it just kind of stopped. And I realized I was in the middle of the attack dog response, okay? So this is something that you have a choice in what you are going to do. I love this quote by Viktor Frankl, uh, who was a neurologist, a psychiatrist, and oh, hey, by the way, Holocaust survivor, okay? So if you think you can't hit the pause button, be encouraged by this. He, he says, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So you have that choice. Even if you feel like you just automatically go into that attack dog or that fearful dog, you have another choice. And that other choice looks like this guy. This guy is the watch and wait dog. I chose a uh, German short hair pointer because they are very still and they are able to calm themselves so that they can make a choice afterwards okay so yay you've done it you've paused you got the watch and wait dog response okay so the purpose of the watch and wait dog is to put yourself momentarily on hold to help you catch yourself before you slip 
back into negativity, okay? It's this place of um, suspension, uh, and it's the space between whatever that stimulus is, scary news line, and whatever response you choose to, to have. The watch and wait dog is the absolute most important dog out of all five dogs um, because it's where you neutralize all that negative energy that's coming up in you. And it's the dog of choice to attack dog or not to attack dog, right? So it, res it represents your response ability. Okay, think about that word. It's your response ability, your ability to respond and not just react. So when you choose the watch and wait dog, you ask yourself questions like, am I practicing openness and curiosity in this situation? How is the state of my emotions? Do I need to calm myself down? What are my choices in this situation? You can mentally ask yourself all of these questions even when somebody else is in your face. It's actually an amazing superpower. I have had people like literally in my face yelling and I'm just inside myself going, okay, stimulus over here. What choice, what kind of response do I want to have? That is your power and that's what you can do, right? So there's some things that you can do to help you be able to stay in the watch and wait dog better. And one of the most superpower things out there is breath work, breathing. Yes, my friends, you can actually calm the state of your system with just the simple breath. I have a picture here of some Navy SEALs because Navy SEALs have to keep their wits about them in actual life-threatening situations where if they, they freak out, they die, right? So they have a technique called box breathing. Box breathing, you can Google it, it's all over the interwebs, but basically it's an idea that you breathe in a box. So breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four, hold for a count of four. Do you see my little box? Breathe in for four, Hold it for four, breathe out for four, hold it for four. Does that make sense? So if you do that for one to two minutes, you will actually take your own fight, flight, or freeze system that you have that's starting to do that thing again, and you'll put it back to sleep, okay? Because when you do that, that tells the amygdala, which is inside your brain, that the coast is clear, and you've got to be able to think that the coast is clear to get out of survival mode and back into safe mode. Another um, technique out there is called coherence breathing. You can Google that. There is also four eight breathing. So breathe in for four, breathe out for eight. And it helps if you do <sighs> at the same time, because think about it. When we're surprised or freaked out, what do, what do we instinctively do? We go, <gasps> right? Well, that sends a system, uh, a signal to your system that it needs to freak out. What do we do when we're relieved? Oh, that sends a, say, a different signal to your system that the coast is all clear. So we're going to be breathing together when we're six feet apart, right? We, we want to be socially responsible. So uh, box breathing, coherence breathing, four, eight breathing. You could also do the ins match the outs. So count to five and count out to five. All of those will do the same thing. And all of those will help you be able to keep from slipping back into attack dog or fearful dog, okay? All right, so you've paused, you've waited, you've done it, good job. What can, what, what can you do next? Well, the next thing you can do is you could be this guy. You can be this sort of dog. And I picked a French Bulldog because these little buggers are so cute and they always get their way. <laughs> okay, so in this sort of dog, um, what you get to do here is you get to start investigating what's going on inside of you and what's going on inside of others. Um, and it's where you become self-aware. Yes. You know who you are, what you want, where you are going. You're not afraid to speak your truth. And in this, in this response, we also create boundaries, right? But we, and we do not give our power away, okay? When you let somebody else make you angry, you just gave your emotional power to that other person. And that is within your control and you want to keep control of that, okay? We become assertive, but we're not aggressive, right? We look after ourselves in this response and here we grow. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to have this little slide up there uh, on the differences between being aggressive and being assertive because, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if everybody is aware. I wasn't aware. Um, so there's different choices that you can make when you're relating with other people. Uh, one is assertive. 
So you're appropriately honest and you're direct. You, you are self-enhancing, right? You are expressive, you are confident. Um, you are empathetic to the feelings and thoughts of others. In contrast, aggressive, inappropriately honest, right? I'm just being honest, right? That's aggressive. Direct, expressive, attacking, blaming, controlling, self-enhancing at the expense of others, okay? And then there's also passive aggressive. Tell me if you've ever met anybody like this, right? Emotionally dishonest, indirect, self-denying at first, self-enhancing at the expense of others later because they won't talk to your face, but they'll go talk to somebody else about you, right? We don't want to choose that. Um, so this is just helpful to learn the difference between being assertive and being aggressive. So when all of those negative feelings are coming up in you right now, they're just signals. All they are is signals that your body, it's, it's sending you a signal that one of your needs is not met. Are you not feeling safe? Are you not feeling free? Are you not feeling heard? Are you not feeling understood, right? Um, anger could result from the need for respect. Fear can reflect a need for reassurance and safety, and that's normal, okay? But when you make this choice, you are identifying the feelings that are coming up in you, right? As you react to whatever that trigger, that outside stimulus is, and you're discovering what needs in you are not being met in that moment, and then you're gonna care for your needs, okay? One wonderful uh, tool to use is this. Um, this is from uh, Nonviolent Communication, which is a wonderful communication book. And if you are struggling with your family right now, maybe you have the same problem that I have and my children leave their socks everywhere, right? And I'm like, attack dog. Why are you leaving your socks? I'm so angry, right? So if I'm gonna be a assertive dog, I could use this tool right here. So it starts with an observation. When I go to my kids, I say, when I see socks left out everywhere, right? Specific situation. Then I can say a, fe a feeling. I feel stressed and frustrated because I need to have some order in my environment right now to lower my stress. And then you follow it up with a request, okay? Would you be willing to not leave your socks everywhere? That gives you some power in that particular situation. It keeps you from just verbally diarying on everybody in your family and it gives some resolution to things. So nonviolent communication is where this came from. Uh, you, utilize this tool, be specific. Don't say, I notice your socks everywhere all the time. No, say specific. When I saw your socks out in the living room this morning, okay, and then you say, I feel. It, it made me feel this way. Not good, you know, because I really need some order. Would you be willing? Okay? So that is one way to be able to be the assertive dog and care for your needs during a stressful time. The last choice is the highest choice, I believe, and it's this guy. This is the empathetic dog. And of course I picked a golden retriever because they're the best empathetic friends on the planet. I love these dogs. Ah. Uh, so the empathetic dog displays empathy, compassion, and understanding of others. When we choose this response in a challenging situation, we take our egos, our fearful little egos, and we put them over there for a while, and we listen to people, and we care for people. And this is where we step into the shoes of the other person, and this is where we connect with others from six feet away, right? Because we have to be socially distanced. So the empathetic dog asks things like, am I respecting the other person's boundaries in this situation? How can I meet the needs of other in this situation? It is very difficult to get to the empathetic dog response if you are in your survival mind. So you first have to care for yourself before you're able to access this. You cannot pour from an empty cup, so take care of yourself first. You can utilize the same phrase uh, that we just talked about for the assertive dog in the empathetic dog response as well. So um, maybe you're looking at your kids right now and they're throwing a tantrum um, because they are picking up on everybody else's stress. And so you could say, hey, um, hey, child, uh, when you had, when you were crying this morning, were you feeling sad, scared, frustrated, and then maybe get their feeling to come out? see what they are feeling, and then ask them what they need. 
Is it because you need this? Is it because you need some cuddling? Is it because you need some fresh air? Is it because you need some certainty, you know? Um, and then offer something to that person to help meet their need. That is the highest choice. And I, I feel on some levels that that's what humanity is being called to right now. So we have a great opportunity to display empathy and understanding to others during the situation. Okay. So the, that's the, um, that's the third, the, that's the three extra choices. We have the watch and wait dog. We have the assertive dog choice, and then we have the empathetic dog choice. Okay. So when you look at all of these guys, here's all five responses that you could choose in challenging situations, which you will definitely have one today and tomorrow and probably the next day. Okay. You have the attack dog. Urgh. You have the scared, fearful, self-doubting dog. You have the watch and wait dog. You have the assertive dog. And then you have the empathetic dog. So if you look at all these guys, ask yourself, where do you spend most of your day? Do you, if you find yourself in some of the attack dog or fearful dog a lot, um, how do you need to meet your needs so that you can be able to pause and choose different responses in these situations? And how would some of your challenging situations that you're experiencing right now be different if you chose to be a different dog in those responses? So um, I, I'm sure that right now you probably are thinking about several triggering situations that have come up, you know, maybe they've come up today, maybe they've come up this past week. Um, you know, just think about one of them, right? And what dog were you in that situation? I can tell you I have been in the attack dog and the fear dog way more than I would like to admit this week. And that's normal, right? We've all been there. But I realize that if I use my tools, if I use my breath work and my grounding, that I have access to different choices that could lead to different outcomes for not only you, but all the people around you. So when you are getting into these responses, ask yourself, is your response productive? Is it unproductive? How can you improve your response in the future? And would you choose a different dog in those triggering situations? And how would that affect your response? So many ways to start looking at the way we show up in this world and how we want to be perceived and how we want to act. And the good news is the choice is entirely yours. And you may not get it right the first time, but I encourage you to just keep trying, just keep trying, be aware of how you're acting, be aware of how you're feeling, and eventually you'll get it. If you keep holding an intention to, to um, show up more mindfully in these challenging situations, you're gonna get there, okay? So just keep trying. Um, so I did learn about, I did adapt this idea from um, Louise Evans, who is a phenomenal TED Talk. She's got an amazing TED Talk out there on um, YouTube. Uh, I'm sure you got nothing but time right now, so you could check that out. She also has a, a website called Five Chairs, Five Choices, which is absolutely brilliant, and I'm indebted to her work. And that is about all I have um, for my, my situation here, for my, my session. I just wanted to close with this one slide. It says, avoiding your triggers isn't healing. Uh, healing happens when you're triggered and you're able to move through the pain, the pattern, and the story and walk your way to a different ending. And that is what I hope for us all right now. So love you so much, Greeley. I hope you are all well and safe and I will see you again soon.